All right, so a Mac that accepts two inch eyepieces, has a dual speed focuser, comes with a focal length reducer and is light and compact enough to be the centerpiece of a travel setup, sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Well, the MK127 from Siboni promises all this and more, but how good is it actually? Especially when comparing it to SETs and even refractors. Well, this is exactly what we are going to find out in this video. So grab a cup of coffee, because this is going to be a good one. Hi, I'm Bogdan Damian and welcome to another video review. Max or Maxtoff Cassegrain telescopes seem very promising on paper. They try to maximize the image quality of a reflector design by using a corrector lens at the front of the OTA called the meniscus. This thick, deeply curved meniscus lens is a spherical surface, meaning that it's part of a perfect sphere. The design's genius is that the spherical aberration of the meniscus itself is used to cancel out the spherical aberration of the spherical primary mirror, which is why Maxtoff telescopes are known for their sharp and high contrast images. My last Mac was a 4-inch Skymax from Skywatcher, and at that time it was one of my favorite telescopes, thanks to the decent image quality and small form factor. Fast forward a couple of years and Sviboni announced the MK127, a 5-inch Mac that on paper promises to improve on the viewing experience of the 4-inch Skymax in every category. So naturally I got very excited when Sviboni offered to send me one to review. But while this is very generous of them, it won't color my opinion about the telescope and they didn't influence the verdict of this video in any way. The MK series of Maxut of Cassegrain telescopes currently consists of three models, a 90, 105 and this new 127mm version. The focal length ranges from 1250 on the smaller one to 1500mm on the 5-inch model. Also, while the first two support only one and a quarter inch eyepieces, the MK127 also works with two inch ones. The MK127 is also the only one in the series that features a Rumac Maxutov design. This means that it employs a three element optical construction featuring a meniscus lens, a primary mirror and a separate secondary mirror instead of just a reflective surface on the back of the meniscus lens like it's usually the case. And this brings some key advantages with it, which we are going to look at in a moment. But in theory, the separate secondary mirror gives Siboni an additional degree of freedom to use better glass and coatings as well as to better correct for aberrations. It also allows for a flatter field of view and a shorter focal ratio without sacrificing image quality. So let's take the MK127 out of the box and take a closer look. The telescope arrived in this unassuming cardboard box with a basic but thick foam inlay to protect the telescope. Inside we find the OTA, let's put it aside for now, and a 2-inch eyepiece adapter and a 0.65x focal reducer capable of transforming the MK127 from an f11.8 into an f7.7 telescope. And this is a really great accessory to have alongside any Mac because it compensates for one of the Mac's drawbacks, the narrow field of view thanks to the very long focal length, allowing for significantly wider views of the night sky. While the reducer is being advertised as an accessory for astrophotography applications, I'll test later on if it can be used for visual observations as well. Alright, switching back to the OTA. The first thing that stands out is the build quality. The whole construction is made out of glass and metal, no cheap plastic bits. 
It feels well put together, conveying a premium feeling when holding it in hand. In spite of it having a metal housing, it isn't very heavy. 2.9 kilograms isn't really much, and with only 33 centimeters in length, including the ducap and visual back, and 15 centimeters in diameter at the widest point, the MK127 is a very compact telescope. At the front we find the fully multi-coated meniscus lens with the central obstruction housing, the secondary mirror on the back side, similar to a Schmidt Cassegrain. This is also where the collimation screws are located, just behind this metal cap. I actually had a bit of a problem taking this cap off because some glue from the manufacturing process got inside the threading and the cap simply wouldn't turn. So I ended up removing the whole meniscus assembly from the telescope, including the secondary mirror. This allowed me to hold down the mirror housing with one hand, while with the other one I tried applying more force on the cap. And this did the trick. The cap finally came loose. But I had to pay the price of completely destroying the collimation of the telescope in the process and it took me a couple of hours later on to get the collimation back on track. Well, this was really annoying and I did report this to Sviboni and suggested they keep an eye out for this issue during quality control. It also showed me how easy the MK127 can be taken apart for maintenance and cleaning. There is nothing clipped in place, just threading that can be unscrewed and this is really refreshing to see. Well, there is a nice metal dust cover included. Unfortunately, there is no dew shield available, which will most likely lead to problems during prolonged observing or astrophotography sessions. This is why I ended up printing my own dew shield to eliminate this issue. Moving over toward the back of the OTA, we find two mounting brackets for a finder scope and maybe a guiding scope. The back of the mirror cell features an SET sized visual back. Attached to it is either a 1.25 inch or a 2 inch eyepiece adapter, with both being supplied with a telescope. The primary mirror is made out of quality optical glass with a 99% reflective aluminum coating. The secondary mirror, being a standalone optical element, also allows for a better than usual optical treatment with this one being dielectrically coated, boasting a 99% reflectivity as well. According to Sviboni, the total light transmission rate for the whole optical system is well above 95%, which again, in theory, should allow for some very bright images. The other feature on the back of the OTA that stands out is of course the dual speed focuser. This is another very important aspect of the MK127 because it allows you to find focus and get that sweet spot where the view is the sharpest more easily. It's light, smooth and has a lot of travel, which also means a lot of back focus, which in turn is crucial when trying to get accessories like bino viewers to work. The MK127 makes a good impression so far. Now let's see how it performs under real observing conditions. But before that, I want to thank you all for watching and liking my videos. This tells YouTube that the videos are interesting, pushing it to even more of us hobby astronomers. And ultimately, this allows me to do what I love, which is creating astronomy content. So thank you. I have had the telescope for over a month now and I had the chance to test it on multiple nights with good seeing conditions from my backyard under Bortel 4 skies. I also want to mention that I will focus on visual observations in this video and I will make a separate video where I will talk about its astrophotography capabilities in detail. Cramming everything in one video would simply be too much. So for visual observations, I've set up the telescope on my trusty AZ Pronto mount and paired it with different eyepieces depending on the test. For high power observations, I use the 9mm delay from Teleview and the SV215 3-8mm zoom eyepiece from Sviboni. As for the diagonal, I had a lower quality 1.25 inch mirror diagonal lying around, but this quickly turned out to be a significant bottleneck for the telescope, which is why I switched to a different, more potent, dielectrically 
coated mirror to maximize performance. And the MK127 put up a strong performance. The views of Saturn and the Moon were very bright and had a lot of contrast, allowing for details to be easily visible. So the well-corrected optics combined with a very high transmission rate indeed provide some really nice results. Sharpness is also good, but not refractor levels good. Just like almost any other reflecting design, the views produced by the MK127 do suffer from the central obstruction caused by the secondary mirror. I would place the sharpness at an 8 out of 10. Also, the image shift from the primary mirror tilting when focusing is minimal, but noticeable nonetheless. This is a result of how the gearing of the focuser assembly pushes or pulls the mirror inside the OTA when adjusting the focuser knob. It's also a very common issue with catadioptric telescopes. For medium to low power views of the moon, I use the 24mm pen optic from Teleview. And just as expected, the views were bright and decently sharp. At this point, I wanted to try out the supplied focal reducer in an effort to increase the field of view even further. Dropping the focal length to 975 mm from 1500 mm would increase the visible area of the night sky significantly. But in order to use the reducer, I had to first find an M42 adapter with a 1.25 inch nose piece since Fibonacci doesn't include one with the telescope. But luckily I had one lying around, so I quickly got to testing. And immediately I understood why Fibonacci doesn't include such an adapter with a telescope. It's because you simply can't reach focus using the reducer in combination with a diagonal and an eyepiece. By bypassing the diagonal and using the telescope in a straight through configuration, I was able to achieve focus, but it is very uncomfortable to use it like this. So there is no question that the focal reducer is really meant only for astrophotography applications. And I double checked this using a camera and indeed there weren't any issues in this configuration. The image provided by the camera with the reducer attached was sharp. Not being able to use the focal reducer for visual observations is a missed opportunity in my opinion. I would have loved to be able to observe DSOs with this telescope as well. While on the topic of focusing, one last thing I wanted to check out was if the focuser had enough travel to fully compensate for the extra light path length added by a binoviewer. In the standard configuration, including a 90 degree mirror diagonal and a max bright 2 bino from Bader Planetarium, I wasn't able to fully reach focus. Roughly 3 mm or so were still needed, which even if it doesn't sound like it, it's actually pretty good, considering that with Newtonian reflectors or refractors, you need to add in bellows or glass path correctors to achieve focus. Here the missing 3 mm can easily be shaved off by simply attaching the diagonal directly to the visual back of the OTA with an appropriate adapter, or alternatively you could simply get a shorter one and a quarter inch eyepiece adapter. And this is what I did. I replaced the standard one with one from Bader that was exactly 3 mm shorter and this was enough for me to achieve focus using a binoviewer. And like I said before in my other videos about binoviewers, being able to observe with both eyes simultaneously is an absolute game changer. And the fact that the MK127 can do this without any bellows or glass path correctors is outstanding. Paired with a couple of 32mm plusers from Bader, the views of the starry Milky Way were spectacular. Alright, so all by itself, the MK127 makes a very solid impression, but how does it compare to other similar priced telescopes? Let's kick off the comparison by putting the MK127 head to head against the Celestron C5 SCT I have reviewed previously. Here I can report that the MK127 outperforms the C5 in terms of brightness and contrast, while sharpness is similar in both telescopes. The differences aren't huge, but noticeable nonetheless. 
The MK127 is more versatile as well thanks to the fact that it supports 2-inch eyepieces and because of the included focal reducer. The all-metal construction from front to back and the dual speed focuser places the build quality of the MK127 a notch above the C5. With respect to the included accessories, the C5 is a more beginner friendly telescope with the included padded soft case, two basic eyepieces and a 45 degrees erect image prism diagonal as well as a 6x30 mm finder scope. This is a complete albeit very basic starting package. Here the MK127 comes with none of these things, so you need to get them separately. It does come with a focal length reducer, however, as mentioned earlier, which for seasoned astronomers that are interested in astrophotography might be more interesting. So for me and from my tests, I would place the MK127 as the clear winner here. All right, next up, I'd like to compare the MK127 to the 4-inch Skymax from Skywatcher. Well, here the MK127 manages to improve on the Skymax's performance in every aspect. Brightness, contrast, sharpness and build quality as well as versatility are noticeably better on the MK127. The only thing that the Skymax has going for it is price and size. So if these are absolutely crucial to you, then get the Skymax. Otherwise, it's a no-brainer. Pick the MK127. There is one last comparison I want to make, since it's a very common question that I get asked in the comments. How does a Mac compare to a refractor? In this case, the MK127 to the SV503 102mm ED refractor. Well, in this scenario, it's the MK127 that has a hard time keeping up. While brightness and contrast levels are similar, when it comes to sharpness and resolving power, the 102 ED is noticeably better both at low and high magnifications. For example, the Mac with the 9mm delight at 166 times magnification isn't as sharp as the ED refractor with the SV215 zoom eyepiece set to 4mm, producing a magnification of 178. On the other hand, the 102 ED does generate some chromatic aberrations, while the images chroming from the Mac don't show such artifacts at all, so that's a plus for the Maxit of Cassegrain telescope. Size and weight are also two aspects where the Mac really shines, but in terms of build quality, the ED refractor comes out ahead again. The focuser assembly alone, including the draw tube, rotator and gearing, is worth every penny. So the ED refractor comes out on top both in terms of image and build quality. So to recap, the MK127 offers a good image quality, it's very versatile thanks to the 2-inch adapter and the focal reducer, can be used for visual observations including bino viewers, can be used for astrophotography both for planetary and deep sky thanks to the reducer and is small and portable that it can be taken everywhere. On the negative side, we have less than perfect image sharpness, no dew shield, a potential quality control issue with the cap for the collimation screws, a focal reducer that is designed for astrophotography applications only. So taking a step back, and looking at these pros and cons, I would say that the pros definitely outweigh the cons, which is why I have no trouble recommending this telescope to anyone looking for a capable but very portable instrument. While the image quality isn't perfect, the versatility and ease of use make up for it. Anyway, that's been it. I hope you all enjoyed it. Let me know what you think about the MK127 and about Maxtop telescopes in general. I'm very much looking forward to reading your opinions in the comments below. Thanks for watching and catch you guys in the next one. <music>